In this video, I'd like to discuss the nature of interpersonal communication in romantic and workplace relationships specifically. So let's start off by uh, discussing romantic relationships and, and communication aspects of communicating in romantic relationships. Uh, first, romantic relationships will vary in their nature in terms of exclusivity and the expectations they have for exclusivity. Um, some relationships are exclusive and considered monogamous. Other relationships are not. And so it's not, again, I want to clarify, we're not talking about better or worse here. We're just talking about understanding the nature of these relationships and that some of them will be expected to be exclusive and involve only those two people, while others will have will not have that expectation and will be able to involve multiple members. Romantic relationships also uh, can have some variance in terms of voluntariness. Uh, sometimes you know, we're forced into a relationship, and that's not necessarily a good situation, but, uh, but uh, well, in different cultures you may have different expectations about voluntariness. You may have some expectation to marry for love, like in westernized cultures, individualistic cultures tend to emphasize love as a basis for that relationship, and so you're expected to choose and be able to choose who you wish for uh, your partner in that relationship. Other really, other uh, cultures, uh, that's more assigned to you. You're, you're expected to marry who your parents select for you, or who's determined to be a good match for you, and, and so you may not have as much choice in and may not be as voluntary in terms of determining the nature of that relationship. Romantic relationships also vary in, in their in the style of love that they have. Uh, some relationships, again, are, are based on love, especially in individualistic cultures where love is the expectation. You're expected to be able to, to choose your own mate and, and do so on the basis of love. Other cultures de-emphasize love. As a, expect love will grow as a part of that relationship, but isn't the primary basis for that relationship. And even when love is the center of that relationship, you find we find that you have different types of love. So, for example, here's one model. This is Sternberg's triangular theory of love. Just one model of, of identifying different factors that are involved in love. But you can see here that there are a variety of ways that people may experience love. Some love is based on, um, you know, passion and, and intimacy. And a combination of those gives you romantic love. Whereas others may be uh, intimacy and commitment, which would give you that companionate love. Uh, and so you see the different expectations exist of what love is and what's going to be involved in love and so um, what's important as much as anything is that, you, that you, both parties agree on on what should be involved in their definition of love and so otherwise you, you run into some conflicts there but this is just one model of love just to indicate that different people may have different expectations of love and different uh, feelings about love and what what it is and, and what constitutes love Romantic relationships uh, involve sexuality, and so uh, that sexuality may vary, though. You have uh, heterosexual relationships, typically between a man and a woman. You have homosexual relationships between two people of the same sex. Um, you, you may have polyamorous, you know, sexuality. Uh, so there's just different types of sexuality that are involved in romantic relationships. And romantic relationships may also vary in terms of their definition of permanence. Some relationships are going to last a long, long time, maybe the lifetime of those people. Others will exist only a short time and, and maybe fizzle out, and you'll have everything in between there. But um, So romantic relationships, there's a sense of permanence, an ideal of permanence there, but doesn't always uh, end up that way. So we also can identify some other variances in romantic relationships, some ways that communication in, in relationships are going to vary. So, for example, uh, there'll be some difference in the way that couples view conflict and the idea of conflict. Uh, so some will be more aggressive in their conflict and more direct in their conflict. Others will, will try and vary it more and, and avoid it a little more. So romantic relationships will vary in the way that they handle conflict. They also vary in the way that they handle privacy. Um, some couples will be very open with them, with each other and with other people surrounding them, their friends and their family. Others are a little more reserved and hold back more information. So they'll vary in terms of the way that they handle privacy. Uh, also vary in the way that they handle emotional communication. Again, some couples very open and, and straightforward about sharing their emotions and others a little more reserved in doing so. Uh, and the same thing applies for instrumental communication. They'll vary in the way that they handle this instrumental communication. Communication like who's going to pick up the kids, who's making dinner, who's doing this. Some couples will choose to be very direct with that and, and maybe maybe prioritize uh, verbal communication, vocal communication in that regard. Others may prefer to text or, or put post-it notes or whatever. They'll, you need to find a system that works for you. But but uh, But Romantic relationships will vary in the way that they handle these different types of communication. Okay, shifting gears just slightly to communication in the workplace. Let's talk about communication in the workplace. First, uh, we have communication uh, among co-workers, friendships among co-workers. You're going to be with these people 
a lot. And so it's natural for friendships to develop um, with your coworkers and, and certain coworkers. We need to remember that, that sometimes these friendships have a context. Um, that sometimes these friendships exist within the workplace, but not necessarily outside of the workplace. It just depends on that relationship and what those two people have in mind. So, um, so may, there may be a context involved that, uh, that uh, that friendship exists in one place, but not necessarily outside of that. They may not pursue that relationship outside of the workplace, and, and that's perfectly acceptable. So sometimes we need to keep that context in mind. We also need to bear in mind that friendships in, uh, amongst coworkers have a variety of values and functions that they serve. So uh, they can be very valuable and serve a variety of different functions, such as uh, workplace friendships can be important for information exchange. There's uh, there's no way to get information out faster than the grapevine at work, right? Through the, through the, the lines of gossip at work. So information exchange can be important uh, amongst friends in in the workplace. Uh, also, they get social support from that when they're having a rough day, when they're having a you know maybe getting chewed out by the supervisor or something. They can provide so a social support. Those friends can they also provide organizational support when you're behind in your work. Maybe your friend steps up and helps you out a little bit, and uh, and helps keep you on pace. Then it's also very important for newcomer assimilation. How do we know what to do in the workplace? Well, we may get some formal training on different things, but, but our friends in the workplace are the real ones who really tell us the important stuff, like like which is the best bathroom to use, uh, or you know who has the which is the cleanest restroom, or which copier works the best, and that kind of thing. This, this, these important things for newcomer assimilation are really critical. Uh, that's a really important function of friendship in the workplace. Friends, we find in the workplace that people have more friendships in the workplace tend to see improved performance, that morale goes up, and you can see an improved performance uh, across the board when you see people that have friends in the workplace. This also helps with retention. Employers want to avoid turnover. They put a lot of time and energy and, and, uh, and resources into training someone, and they'd like to keep you around. And we know that friendships, having friends in that workplace can help with retention, it will help somebody want to stick around. It's also helpful in terms of organizational change. When you have change coming in the organization and you have that social support, you have people who can help you out in doing things, and that's important. And then organizational enhancement, just the overall uh, well-being and, and, and function of that organization is enhanced by having these friends. So they do serve a variety of functions and, and can be very, very valuable, these friendship relationships in the workplace, when they're going well. When they're not, and you see this deterioration of friendships in the workplace, then that can be an issue. It can lower morale. It can do the opposite of all those things we just talked about. It can interrupt information exchange. It can lower morale. It can just be really disruptive in the workplace when these friendships deteriorate and then terminate. It can be an awkward situation. So uh, something to, to bear in mind as well there. Uh, finally, romantic relationships among coworkers we can talk about. Uh, lots of workplaces have, uh, for years, we're trying to... Um, resist this idea that people, you know, you weren't allowed to have a relationship with somebody you work with. Well, they kind of got over that idea because it was happening all the time anyway, and people were just keeping it a secret. So now most workplaces have guidelines for such things, like you can't be in a romantic relationship with somebody who is immediately above or below you in the in the hierarchical structure. You can't be in the same line of report as someone you're in a romantic relationship with. Uh, you need to disclose this to HR and, and all kinds of rules that, that go along with having a romantic relationship in the workplace. And again, they can have a, a lot of those same positive effects, but they can also have some of the negative effect, especially when you have the deterioration and termination of those relationships in the workplace. You can see a lot of uh, destructiveness in a workplace based on that. So you do need to be cautious about romantic relationships in the workplace uh, with coworkers. And, uh, so. In addition to, to coworkers and just having friends with people who are in the same on a hierarchical level as you in the organization. You also have the relationships between superiors and subordinates. And sometimes, you know, you have your workplace relationships, obviously your task-oriented relationships. Sometimes these though, can develop into social relationships as well. It can provide a lot of the same functions as, as friendships in the workplace with coworkers, information exchange, social support, uh, help with organizational change. All those types of things can be enhanced by having a, a social relationship with your superior or with your subordinate, depending on the situation. Uh, in the workplace, so um, those can develop into social relationships. Uh, at times, they can develop into romantic relationships as well, right? Which, again, can create some challenges. A lot of organizations have rules about this that you're not allowed to date somebody who's in the same line as report. As a supervisor, you're not allowed to date somebody who's who works for you or, or vice versa. A lot of times they would handle that by, by asking one of you to change departments or to just to move somewhere out of the line of report, um, but it is important to keep in mind that Romantic relationships between superiors and subordinates can be very, very complicated in general, and a lot of times they're not allowed really by by rule in the workplace, and, and they would expect you to make some sort of change 
in order to, to maintain that romantic relationship if you wanted to. Finally, you, you need to be cautious in, in terms of superiors and subordinates, uh, aware of sexual harassment, um, which can exist uh, certainly between superiors. It can exist anywhere in the workplace, but it's much more noticeable and, and much more frequent between superiors and subordinates because one person feels like they don't have the power in that relationship to do anything about it and to, to really uh, have a say in that. So as a superior in particular, you need to be hyper aware of avoiding any situation that would give the appearance of impropriety, that would give somebody the impression that you were trying to pressure them into uh, any kind of uh, sexual situation. You need to just avoid that entirely and be hyper aware of your communication in those types of situations. Finally, we need to consider a relationship with clients. Um, again, having a solid social relationship with your clients can be, can enhance that relationship a lot and can be very productive uh, in, in, in terms of workplace communication. But we need to be, again, aware of the complications that can exist with social relationships with customers and with clients outside of the workplace. And, and certainly romantic relationships with clients can, can present some um, specific challenges. So you need to be uh, aware of those that, that, that relationships with clients will have a lot of the same challenges and difficulties um, that, that those other workplace relationships would have as well. So let's take a look at uh, online communication at work. This is becoming much more frequent. We're communicating with our with our coworkers and our superiors and our subordinates much more commonly online than we ever used to. So um, some things to keep in mind for online communication at work. Um, first, you need to learn and follow your organizational policy. They probably have policies about all kinds of things related to online communication, from things down to your, your email signature and, and where you can log in, how you can use it, and what you can forward, and what kind of information you can share, uh, proprietary information that you can share online. We need to be aware of what all of the organizational policies are surrounding our communication at work so that we're, we're in line with organizational policy. I'll say you need to use it as a convenience, not as a shield. Don't use online communication to avoid something, to avoid conflict, to avoid confrontation, to avoid you know some task that you don't want to do. Use workplace, use online communication for things that make your job easier, not in order to get away from things you don't want to do. Don't write it if you wouldn't say it in person. And my mom always used to say that. And if you don't want somebody to read it, then don't write it down. So if you wouldn't say it to somebody to their face, then certainly don't write it down and send it to them via email or, or you know other text message or whatever. Uh, the disinhibition effect is very much at play here in online communication in the workplace. So you need to think very carefully about uh, and be you know again hyper aware of the fact that this is going to be permanent. This is something that's going on and this is going to leave an impression on this person. So is would I say this to their face? And is this how I would say it if, if we were standing face to face? Have that in mind at all times. Keep in mind that electronic communication leaves a trail. So when you send a message, it's going to be out there and, and traceable and trackable. So you're kind of committed to that and that can be good and bad, but be aware that it's going to leave that trail and, and be available for others to, to pick up on. Uh, you can also flip that around and use that trail to your advantage. Somebody says, well, you didn't get this done on time. And, you know, you can say, well, I did. I sent it to you on this date. Here's the email that I that shows that I communicated that to you or whatever. You can use that trail to your advantage. And you also need to know your audience. It, it, depend, you know, you choose your language wisely. Choose the types of things you're sharing online uh, wisely. Choose whether or not to even send this online wisely. If you have a boss that doesn't use email that much and is not reliable about checking their email or text messages, then don't send it to them that way, right? You need to know your audience about what you're sending and how you're sending it and what channel you're using and all that kind of stuff. So, so keep your audience in mind, uh, certainly, with online communication at work. If you have any questions regarding uh, communication in romantic relationships or in the workplace, please, please feel free to email me about this and any other content uh, related to interpersonal communication that you'd like to chat about. I'd be happy to engage with you uh, via email, so, so feel free to hit me up. And in the meantime, happy communicating.